There are a lot of buildings in this game, and for so many of them, the answer to this question is a hard it depends. You exchange money for things like governing capacity, monthly autonomy, manpower, for summit, and even sailors. It's hard to rank the utility of something like a fort or a rampart. However, some buildings exist to make you money. And since these buildings also cost money, we can sit down and analyze them within that context. Right, before we go look at spreadsheets, let's get the usual things out of the way. A like would be appreciated, and a subscription would be amazing. With that said, let's get into the spreadsheet. Now, before we consider investing money into buildings, I know that a lot of you run with debt. There are a couple players that are very, very debt averse. In some cases, literally only taking loans to take institutions and never taking loans. Loans are a tool that should be used. And although some people are certainly very aggressive when it comes to taking debt, the reality of the situation is, is that when it comes to any kind of investment into buildings, we need to make sure that an investment into just paying off our debt is not a better way of spending our money. If after all, we can get a better return on our investment into buildings by just paying off debt, a lot of the time we're just better off paying off debt. Another thing to remember, and this is important, is that building buildings does not give you inflation. However, taking loans and having loans does. Inflation is bad, it makes everything, including future buildings, more expensive. And while I don't know the state of the inflation in your game, after all, you could be sitting at 0% inflation with a couple inflation reduction tickers, meaning that the inflation isn't really a thing that's happening to you or an issue, it's something to bear in mind. Anyway, with your standard loan, you're going to be paying 4% interest per annum, and with a burger loan, you'll be paying 1%. Of course, this depends on many other factors. There are some interest per annum reductions you can get to make it better, and there are things that increase your interest per annum as well. However, a lot of the time, you're not on negative stab, which increases your interest per annum, and you're, unless you're playing something like Florence, which has interest per annum, or you're playing in the Bohemia area next to Hungary, where is that monument in Hont in Slovakia, you're not going to have that easy access to interest per annum. And even if you are playing as Hungary and you literally start with a monument, you're not exactly usually flush with cash to upgrade it. With that said, there are also situations where it's worth actually taking debt, especially if you can get a much better annual percentage return on your investment than you are going to get from paying off debt. So let's take a look at those now. A lot of the time, the common advice is to build workshops and temples when you see this return per month figures, these figures here, sit around one. I'm actually going to be focusing is for this entire spreadsheet at the return per month number, as this is the number you see in the macro builder. So a lot of the other things later are going to be normalized to these numbers. It's all well and good talking about theoretical numbers from manufacturers and talking about theoretical workshop production facilities and production efficiency buffs and goods produced and all things. But at the end of the day, let's remember that when we're in the actual game, we're clicking build workshop, build temple, the number we're seeing are these numbers here. We've seen the build cost and we've seen the return per month. So what does that mean? Well, on a 0.1 workshop or temple, we'll be seeing a 1.2 return each year. After all, they're 12 months in a year and we're getting 0.1 a month. This means that we'll be taking a 1.2% annualized return or 1.08% on a 0.9 and a 0.96% on anything as 0.08. In terms of years until payoff, and this does take into account the construction time of the uh, building in question as well, we're going to see that it's going to take us roughly 100 years, give or take, to actually pay off the building and then start being pure profit. This means that unironically, for workshops and temples up until 0.09 and 0.1s, it's genuinely worth taking burger loans to build them, as you're going to get a high return on investment. However, with the return being 0.08% better off than burger loans, and you deprive yourself of the utility of having burger loans if you need that money in an emergency, as well as the inflation gain from burger loans, the 0.1 figure in terms of investing into your economy makes more sense as you're actually getting a 0.2% return, which is at least something more reasonable. However, compared to every other situation, you shouldn't be doing that. With that said, though, it is a bit unrealistic, unironically, to assume that we're sitting in a situation where our buildings are going to be costing 100 ducats. That is because in many cases, a lot of the popular nations that are played in this game, many of them are taking place in areas like India. You're playing in India, you're playing in Europe, you're playing in something like Russia. And a lot of countries actually have a decent amount of access to some small building cost reductions. First of all, the Renaissance gives you 5%, and that's practically for everyone in the game, you're going to pick that up for 5% cost. You're also going to be able to, if you're a Catholic, you get 10% cost reduction from the Pope, and you're a Catholic until the 1500s if you're in Europe. Or you're not a Catholic, you're going to find yourself being something like Orthodox, in which case you also have access to an icon for 10% construction cost reduction. Now, your things may be spent in other places, but you can also have construction cost reduction from a good ruler trait. You can get construction cost reduction if you're playing in Iberia, and you get one of the construction cost holy orders. Again, there's a a lot of things that can give you construction costs in the game and what i find is it's more reasonable to actually consider 
the practical prices of your church and workshops to be sitting around 90 ducats. Because while there is some ways to knock that down to say 15% or even 20% off, you're also going to be having inflation, which is going to increase it and a lot of other things as well. So for that reason, I'm going to be taking some kind of mini global average and look at the practical price of churches and workshops at 90. The other thing we have to also bear in mind is that the 0.1 is a bottom value. So this uh, sheet from here on out takes a look at a much larger range of values going from 0.07 all the way to 0.4s. Now, 0.4s you're not going to see on workshops and temples unless you're building them in something like Paris. So how does the return on investment on a workshop in Paris basically look? From a financial point of view, a 0.4 a month return on a workshop in Paris or something that already has 10 dev is going to come to 4.8 ducats a year or 0.04 a month. Again, all the math here is automatic. This gives us a 5.33% return and actually pays us off in 20 years. This return is so good, it actually beats normal loans. As a matter of fact, you break even with the normal loans at around a 0.3. However, I'm still going to put that as a no for the beats normal loans calculation, as bear in mind those loans do come with the inflation thing on top. But a 0.3 return on a church or a workshop, assuming you're building it for around 90 ducats, does come to equal your loans. So this is the part where you should be building it. Another thing to also consider is on highly dev provinces, a decent chunk of the time, although not always, you'll be expanding infrastructure. Maybe not in single player, but certainly in multiplayer and in some tall single player campaigns as well, which gives you extra construction cost, which makes it even more worthwhile to build them in those areas. In that case, however, another thing I'm going to build to mind is that if you're already going for a tall game, you're going to be building these buildings anyway. So it's less of an argument because you're intending to dev to the moon. And of course, the higher the dev, the better the return for this becomes. But as a general rule of thumb is that 0.3 workshops and temples are so good, anything above that, you should genuinely consider taking loans to start building them, especially if you start looking at 0.35 workshop or temple, you should genuinely take a loan to build these mathematically. Then if you look at the rest of the uh, temples and workshops, we expect to see pretty normal numbers until we get around to 0.1, where again, this is where we start to hit the general conventional wisdom of build workshops and temples until 0.1. It is still a good idea giving you a 1.33% annualized return. And this is a good time to point out that this column is rounding to two significant figures because I don't want to give myself a brain aneurysm looking at 5.33333333% annualized return as this uh, goes entirely across my screen and wastes all my space. Not something I want to be looking at. So just a heads up, this has been localized to, well, I say localized, this has been um, reduced to two significant figures. Anyway, in essence, we are still hitting the 1% return, which is where I would consider a decent return for early game investments up until 0.8. And this is where I've also been a bit more aggressive. I, because I like to invest in my economy more aggressively than other people, tend to still build workshops and temples until 0.08. Because costing 90, you're still technically beating your burger loans, which I think makes it a decent investment. My 0.07 even if you're running 10% off your buildings, you're still not even beating burger loans. So at that point, save your money and invest into other things, even if that other thing is invading your neighbor to take over their land to build workshops in their land. Once you go above 100 years until payoff is where I'm starting to um and ah. Realistically, you want to be looking at something that pays for itself in up to, I'd say, 50 years for being something that's really, really good to build. And up to 100, I'd say, is fine. And another thing that's, I think, important to mention in terms of years until payoff is, yes, this is when you do start profiting purely. But bear in mind, you four numbers tend to only really go up. You're going to get events that give you random development. You're going to get your autonomy to go down if the autonomy is affecting these numbers, which, by the way, it will be. If you have a higher debt province that just has more autonomy on it, this will be reflected in this return per month. So again, this return per month value is ignoring all the local autonomy modifiers, any goods produced you have, etc., etc., etc. Right? But I, I, I digress. In general, numbers in EU4 tend to only go up. So this number, as your autonomy decreases, as you get random dev events, etc., is only going to go down until the years of total payoff fall. And a very another important factor is, as your income rate increases, your capacity to take loans increases as well. So if you invest in your country, you'll be able to take more loans because you have a higher income, which lets you have more debt and hence have more money as access to money. Doesn't mean you can afford that money, but you have access to that money if you definitely need it. But anyway, in terms of workshops and temples, you are still beating burger loans all the way down to 0.08. However, workshops and temples are kind of the starting point. Let's take a look now at the big money makers, manufacturers. Now, manufacturers are really, really good because not only do they give you flat goods produced, they also affect the trade value of the province. However, we'll address that in a bit. Let's just look at manufacturers in a flat environment, assuming that you build a manufacturing and you retain none of the trade value. Let's say you're playing as Poland, you build your manufacturing, and then Austria comes along and steals literally 100% of your trade. So we'll be looking at three numbers for your manufacturing terms. We'll be looking at 0 0.5 manufacturing, 0 0.4 manufacturing, and 0 0.3 manufacturing. We also assume we have no construction cost reductions for now. This means we're paying 500 ducats and we're getting a 0 0.5 return. We're only barely hitting a 1.2% return 
in terms of our annual S percentages. In fact, it very quickly falls off. Even 0.4 manufacturers are considered good are starting to look really, really bad in this case. And indeed, manufacturers look quite bad within this context. If you're spending 500 ducats, you're getting barely 1% return on good manufacturers. You're barely ever meeting burger loans and the five years of construction cost, which is taken into account here in the years until payoff, is relatively brutal as well. Now, construction time can be reduced. There are some modifiers for it, much less common than construction cost. However, I think by the time you get around to the actual manufacturing building, you are going to be in a situation where you have around 20% construction cost reduction. It tends to be further into the game. You're around tech 10, tech 11, tech 12. You have more access to being able to complete things like infrastructure ideas that have minus 10% construction cost. You'll be able to do things like the HRE, uh, tier one reform, which gives you 5%. There's a lot of small stuff like that that you really pick up and you definitely get a decent chunk of construction cost. Now, this doesn't always mean you get up to 20%. I've seen less, I've seen more, but 400 for a menu, I think is a reasonable thing to look at as a middle point. And the math is based around that. If you want to change your math around here, well, the good news is the spreadsheet, you can just change it to make 450 and it adjusts your annualized return and everything for you automatically. So anyway, I digress here. When we're taking a look at manufacturers being 400 ducats, we're going to also now take into account normal trade. So I'm going to assume you're going to retain around 80% of your trade value and you're going to have something like 20% trade efficiency, which is going to basically cancel out to you don't have any trade efficiency buff, but you retain all your trade value. Of course, in practical environments, if you built a large empire in single player, you're going to be able to genuinely retain 100% of your trade and you're going to have more than the 20% trade value. So you're going to profit on that trade as well as on the goods produced. For those unaware, the way the manufacturers work is they give you a flat amount of goods produced. And goods produced is also how trade value is generated. So if you make one ducat from production, you also generate one ducat worth of trade value, which then can be steered, can be collected, all those other things. This is why trade is such a monstrous way of making money because all the trade steering can come in, all the trade efficiency comes in, all those beautiful things happen. Whereas we're actually entirely ignoring trade efficiency for the calculations here. We're assuming that you make the money and you immediately collect it because any number above this is going to be just extra little cookies on top. When you knock down your manufacturers down to 400 and you start to include the doubling effect because you're getting both the trade value and the normal value, I manually increased here the collection value of the 0.5 manufacturers, 0.4 and 0.3 to be basically doubled to give us a 1, a 0 0.8, and a 0 0.6. I've kind of broken my own rule here because this return per month column is meant to be what you see when you go to construct a manufacturer. And don't worry, I'll address this in a second. But in essence, we see that this is the actual value you'll be getting from the column above, up above because you should have your construction costs and you should have your trade. And by this point, any 0 0.5 manufacturer starts to become really good and a 3% return rate. So this is basically building a workshop on like your 30 dev promises early. More specifically to compare, this is equivalent of a 0 0.22 return per month workshop of building a 0 0.5 on a menu. Let's now take a look at this side of the spreadsheet here. Yeah, I prepared everything. Now then, so what we're looking at here, again, we have our reminder of our interest per annum for our debt and the burgers and that fact that inflation exists. We're now going to be looking at menus and their normal trade goods, but we're a bit late in the game. We haven't had time to build workshops and temples and everything everywhere. So we're nice and happy with that. Now, we still have our 400 building costs, but this column on the left is a what you see and then the actual return per number. Now, the return per number assumes that we are going to be getting in this return column just normal trade income, right? We're not going to get 150% trade efficiency. We're not going to get anything stupid like a huge amount of trade steering. We're just producing the manufacturing and collecting immediately on our trade. With workshops built on a good trade good, you will see up to, I would say for now, a plus one manufacturer. These do exist. This, these are your Tech 15 manufacturers on excellent trade goods like silk and on cloth. These, these are a thing. If you don't believe me, go play in Persia. You'll see these all the time. This is basically, however, the top margin of it. You're still going to be, for the most part, seeing 0.6s to 0.4s. But with the analyzed returns on a 1, you start to hit 6% annual returns, which is an incredible rate and makes it absolutely worth taking loans to build those manufacturers. As a matter of fact, assuming you're holding on to your trade, it's actually worth taking loans all the way up to a 0.7 manufacturer. Now, there is a 4% versus a... 4.2% return, so it's only barely worth it to build 0.7 manufacturers. I would genuinely, if you're actually taking loans to build these, bear in mind inflation, would take loans to build up to 0.8 as you'll get a 0.8% overall annual return on them. However, that is more up to you and depends how tightly you want to play it. The payoff points really for this start to kind of crater. On a plus one manufacturer, you pay yourself off in 20 years and that includes the plus five years you take just to build a thing. So it, it starts to get really good. However, if we're comparing to burger loans and the 1% return rate, we actually have to go all the way down to a 0.2 manufacturing to hit that numbers. This will occur if you have really high autonomy, in which case just wait for the autonomy to get fixed and you're not, this number will go up. 
or you ha you're playing the game and you're trying to build a grain manufactory by that one event that decreases the price of grain by like 90%. So grain is going for like 0 0.75. That is the only time you're going to see numbers this low for a manufactory return. As the quite literal base on the worst trade good is going to be putting you around 0 0.24. So that's just something to bear in mind. But even in the worst case scenarios, you actually still hit a 1.2% annualized return, me meaning that you actually still beat burger loans, which is kind of incredible. Just goes to show how an, an amazing deal burger loans are. But basically, this is where manufacturers really come in for making you loads of money. Most of them are going to be sitting around the 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And if you're just retaining your trade, so you get an actual monthly return of around 0 0.8 and 1, just again, nothing too special. You're just immediately collecting the trade. You're going to be hitting around 3 to 2.5% returns on your decent workhorse manufacturers. Anything above that is going to be even prettier for you. But that's okay. That's just your normal trade for all your manus. What about if we stack some goods produced? So we get our numbers from 1 to like 1.2, our 0 0.7 has become 0 0.9, even our 0 0.6 has got up to 0 0.7 or something similar in that regard. And we get 50% trade efficiency. So this is going to take into account maybe not 50% trade efficiency, maybe more like 40, as well as being able to retain our trade and maybe getting one or two ticks of trade steering. How good do manufacturers become? Now I've decided to represent this in the calculations for how good these manufacturers become by multiplying the return value by 2.5. So you'd be multiplying by 2 to affect the trade good gain but i'm also giving an extra 50 percent worth of trade efficiency in the top so you're getting two and a half times actual return on this 1.2 figure that you see in game well the best case scenario of your silk manufacturer going through one step of trade steering that gives you 1.2 return is actually going to be giving you three return giving you 36 ducats a month which comes to a pretty nine percent annualized return paying off the manufacturer in just 16 years and being absolutely worth to take loans. As a matter of fact, in this drive to build, which isn't even anything too crazy, it's just some little bits of goods produced with some trade efficiencies thrown in, absolutely every country can achieve it. You are beating the return rate on normal loans all the way down to 0 0.6 manufacturers, which is quite impressive. Now, the general rule of manufacturers, the wisdom, as it were, um, came to build manufacturers until 0 0.4. I guess this is in to take into account that you won't have that much trade coming in. So it's taking a look at these figures here. And so I can see where that 0 0.4 came from to get that 1% return. The issue with that statement is, of course, is that manufacturers give you that trade value and trade efficiency is not that hard to come by, etc., etc., etc. So when you take into account all of that, you should be building manufacturers that quite literally everywhere on until 0 0.2. In fact, to not be burger loans, we need to make up a new class of manufacturers at 0 0.1, which to the best of my knowledge, quite literally don't exist. Unless, again, you get like 90 autonomy in your provinces and don't shove them into a trade company. So basically, manufacturers are almost always good to build if you care about money. Now, at some point, of course, you're going to be in a state where you don't care about money. This is probably when you do have your healthy amount of goods produced and trade efficiency. But in essence, manufacturers are really strong, so much so that even in this relatively not too over-the-top economic setup, you have like 20, 30 percent goods produced and you have you just retain your trade and have 50 percent trade efficiency. You should actually still be taking loans all the way up to a 0 0.6 manufacturer. This the breakpoint here is around 0 0.55. Basically, manufacturers are just really that good for printing you extra money. And the thing is, and this entire spreadsheet just demonstrates how strong the custom nation ability of plus two goods produced is, because in essence, it gives you two free manufacturers on every single province. But that's a rant at paradox for another day. In terms of actually building buildings for manufacturers, if you've got for a decent economic setup, you should be taking loans to build manufacturers all the way up to 0.6s. The argument, of course, against building manufacturers on grain provinces is that usually you do reach a point where you have enough money and you're now going to be missing things like manpower, in which case things like soldiers' households are going to be much better to build on grain provinces as they gain extra buffs. In that case, don't be scared to delete your manufacturing. And don't think that just because it takes 30 years to pay for itself as well, and you've only had it for 20, that you should feel stupid about deleting it. No, you needed money later. You've reached this point now in the game where you don't need money that much. If you don't need money, feel free to get rid of your income. This is another thing that is very weird within EU4. There is a certain way of bragging rights about having 300 or 400 income. If you finish the World Conquest on 100 income or you finish on 300, it doesn't really matter. Your goal is the World Conquest. How you get there is up to you. If you needed the money to build temples everywhere to help you convert, sure, it's nice, but money doesn't win wars inherently just on its own. You can't throw money at Prussia until they surrender. That's not really how that works. So if what's hindering you is things like manpower, then obviously you should delete your manufacturers and build manpower buildings instead, and so on and so forth. With that all said, that is all I have time for today. Thank you very much for watching. With a special thank you to my channel members, especially Ark, Solar, Salemon, W. Haste, Sebastian Haller, Chandog 2.0, Nick Huss, Dark Fortuna, Big Salad, Lab Josh, Gay Fug, Clockwork Norse, and Golden Arrows.